Good morning. We are going live from home today, just online. A lot of folks are getting allergies and we just want to stay safe. We do have a couple of announcements. First of all, at uh, the, well, at both churches, both churches have given uh, an amount of money to the Nyanic Market and to the Java Jacks Cafe in Iliopolis and sent flyers to all of the school employees so that they can go and get a sweet treat or enjoy a cup of coffee on us just to show our appreciation. Also, uh, the middle school principal has reached out to me and the church in Iliopolis has good Wi-Fi. So we are trying to put together a little pod for remote learning and it'll take place for two hours on Monday two hours on Tuesday evening, and two hours on Thursday mid-morning. If you're interested in helping with that, please let me know. It will be a small contained group, a maximum of eight students and two adult volunteers. Nobody else will be in the building. So let me know if you're interested in that. I already have a few who have reached out. We need a few more. So let us now turn our hearts and our minds to worship. Let us pray together. Mighty God, who lifts us up, reside in our hearts today. Help us to listen closely for your word to us. Remind us that you are always with us throughout all our lives. Give us confidence in your presence so that we may go into your world ready to witness to your love through our works and our deeds. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from the letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And the context of this letter is really important in understanding the scripture and the message that comes from it. Ephesians was a Roman capital in the in Asia Minor. It was a major city. It was on the coast of what we know as Western modern day Turkey. It was Asia Minor at that point. It sat on the Aegean Sea across from Athens and it was a major trade work route and there was a Roman temple to Diana set up in the city. There were all kinds of cultures that found their way to Ephesus, which is common when a city becomes a major trade route, both on land and on sea. A lot of cultures were present there. A lot of belief systems were present there. And Paul, on his second missionary journey, visited Ephesus, and he spent three years there establishing a church. And later, when he was imprisoned in Rome, he wrote this letter not only to the church in Ephesus, but to be read in Ephesus and the other surrounding churches. And here's what he has to say. <clears throat> he says, Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the spiritual blessings that Christ has brought us from heaven. Before the world was created, God had Christ choose us to live with him and to be his holy and innocent and loving people. God was kind and decided that Christ would choose us to be God's own adopted children. God was very kind to us because of the son he dearly loves, and so we should praise God. Christ sacrificed his life's blood to set us free, which means that our sins are now forgiven. Christ did this because God was so kind to us. God has great wisdom and understanding, and by what Christ has done, God has shown us his own mysterious ways. Then, when the time is right, God will do all that he has planned, and Christ will bring together everything in heaven and on earth. God always does what he plans, and that's why he appointed Christ to choose us. He did this so that we Jews would bring honor to him and be the first ones to have hope because of him. Christ also brought you the truth, which is the good news about how you can be saved. You put your faith in Christ and were given the promised Holy Spirit to show that you belong to God. 
The Spirit also makes us sure that we will be given what God has stored up for his people. Then we will be set free and God will be honored and praised. So the culture in Ephesus was quite diverse. There was a massive auditorium that was set up so that they could hold public meetings and the auditorium would hold 25,000 people. Now by auditorium, I want you to imagine an outdoor arena type setting where the stone benches are carved into the ground in tiers and it funnels the sound from the stage outward. It could hold about 25,000 people. When you walk into Ephesus from the land, the first thing that you encounter are huge statue statues and archways as you enter the city. And it's so you will be rightly impressed and intimidated because you don't want just anybody coming into the city thinking they can take over. So that was a common practice that you line the road entering your city with everything that shows how powerful and important you are so that the folks that come in are well aware and know their place within the city. Also within Ephesus, there were many different belief systems. Now, we have different belief systems in our world today, but back in those times, it was much more regional. Whatever kingdom or fiefdom that you lived in, that would have specific beliefs. There would be a specific God that would be in charge of your village or your city. And in Ephesus, when all of these people came together, it's called syncretism, that you have a, a buffet of religious or spiritual beliefs, and you pick and choose little items from each one to be a part of your own belief system. In the backdrop of this, Paul goes to establish a church, and he spent three years there. Of course, he got arrested and beaten within an inch of his life while he was there, but he set up a church, and after three years, when he continued his journey, on the third journey, he ended up being imprisoned in Rome. And he wrote letters to Ephesus and to the other communities around there. And Ephesians is regarded as the letter for the churches. Whenever we talk about how churches should work together in our modern day world, it's the letter of Ephesians that provides the vocabulary and the, the theology for working together. It's the letter of Ephesians that describes how God has a new economy. In other words, God had come to be known to the people throughout the world through the Jewish people. God had called Abraham and established a people and a covenant. And now God would be establishing this church, this new economy, how God would be known and experienced with in the people, not only of that area, but throughout the world is now being established. And we look to this letter of Ephesians for a lot of that information. Paul's other letters to different churches would address a problem specific to that church. But this letter to Ephesians was meant for the church in Ephesus and many others around. So it's not a specific dealing with a specific problem, but it's to be given advice and how to set up this new economy and this new life for all of God's people. And there were some common resistance, some common errors and some common problems that would arise in Paul's churches. And the first is Gnosticism. Now Gnosticism, and it's spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, -S, Gnostics, and then the variation Gnosticism, if you wanted to look it up. This was a belief and had followers who believed that what was spiritual was holy and what was tangible or physical or created was corrupt. So there was a division in 
life and belief, and a lot of this still exists today. Plato is the one who began this line of thinking, and it's still present in our culture today, that anything that's created is corrupt. Anything that has a matter in mass is corrupt. Only that which is ex exists in the spiritual realm is true and pure and divine. Okay, well, not a big deal. Well, maybe not until we come to this person of Christ who we proclaim to be fully human and fully divine. And the Gnostics wouldn't go there. The Gnostics said no. Jesus, the guy from Nazareth, he was not God incarnate because he's a human being. He is corrupt. Anything that has skin and bones or matter or mass or being is corrupt. Only what's in the spiritual realm is divine. So you can imagine that as they're trying to get this new understanding of how God has opened up eternity and it expressed God's self to humanity, the key part of that is Jesus as Savior and it, for eternity and for the here and now. And the baseline of that understanding is that Jesus was fully human and Jesus was fully divine. So that's problematic when Paul leaves and other people go in and follow Paul where he has been and undoes the work that he does. And he says, sorry, what Paul told you was wrong. Here's the truth. So that was one issue that they were facing during that time. Now, we don't call it Gnosticism today. We don't have campaigns against the Gnostics, but we do have this in our society. And I think it manifests itself more commonly when people are spiritual, but not religious. In other words, when we separate the church and humanity from the experience of God on earth. And it is very similar because people that are spiritual and not religious by and large have been hurt by people in the church or offended or somehow told that they are less than or not worthy. And that is something the church has to get better at doing. But we are a human institution. And we can't separate the humanity from the experience of God. So that thought is still with us today as the church struggles to be human and fallible and point to God, which is divine and holy. But who did God send to tell to share that word? Well, God sent human beings and you know, honestly, I think there maybe should have been a plan B because plan A doesn't work well all the time. But there isn't a plan B. It's you and me and all the other people. We are the vessels. Paul says in Corinthians that we carry this in clay jars. Clay can be broken, but it can also be a vessel to carry life-sustaining water. And that's how God chooses to be known throughout the world, through fallible human beings. And that's important because how would we learn about grace or forgiveness if we weren't fallible? And those are integral to who God is. So we still fight that today. We can't separate the human element from our faith. God is where the messes are. God is where there is destruction. God is present with those people. Wherever there is a mess in this world, that's where God is. So we can't be afraid of the mess. We're going to get messy ourselves. And that's just part of the gospel message. That's what it means to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. Now, a second issue that Paul dealt with commonly was Judaizers. And what that means is, now see, we're talking about a group of Jewish folks who have 
experienced this amazing story of Jesus and the redemption that he brought. That has a Jewish beginning. Jesus was Jewish. He was a practicing Jewish man. And it is from that background that we have our beliefs today. And it was difficult after, well, at first it was fine. This community, these group of Jewish folks were spreading the word among themselves that Jesus had shown them something new about God and eternal life. Okay, all was good and fine until these Gentiles came in and that blew the lid off of things because this was problematic. Jews and Gentiles did not eat together. They did not sit together. They did not touch the same food. They did not consume the same food. So imagine having a potluck supper after church. What do you do with all these other folks? So this was a crisis that the early church had to face. And if you read in Galatians, you'll see a big blow up about this whole issue. And what it came down to was after a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, there were two sides. There were people that said, you have to be Jewish first in order to follow Christ. And then there were others, including Paul, who said, no, we are adopted into this faith through Christ. We don't have to be Jewish first. We are brought in as children of Abraham through adoption that we are all God's people. So no, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow the Jewish traditions. You don't have to follow the lifestyle of an observant Jewish person in order to know Christ, to know God through Christ. So this was, this was a problem because that was a teaching that this is how you know God for thousands of years handed down generation after generation after generation. It's not just the way we've always done it. It is the only way that it is done. And now all of a sudden we're including other people that we have been told mm -mm, they are, they don't belong with us. So this was hard. Paul was preaching a message of inclusion that was going against generations and centuries and centuries of teaching. And that's always, always hard. So not only did Paul have people that were struggling against the fully divine and fully human element, but now there were folks that were also present that were saying, mm, nope, sorry, all these other folks, they can't be a part of us. And we still have that today. We very much still have that in our understanding in our church today, by and large, that we have an understanding of people who are in and of people who are out. And Paul's words are clear. We don't own the keys to the kingdom because the kingdom of God was never locked to begin with. And then the third issue that Paul had were the false teachers. The false teachers were those who literally followed in Paul's footsteps wherever he set up a church. And after he left, they would go in and they would change the rules and tell the people really kind of what they wanted to hear. For the false teachers, they were steeped in that Greek understanding of major gods like Zeus and then the minor gods that would mete out different punishments or benefits or honors among the people. And they had a special knowledge that you needed to speak in order to get moved past these low level gods to have a relationship with the higher level gods. And that was a very common, easy thing for folks in that day to understand. It was familiar. It was common. And faith in one God alone is radical and different and hard. So it's easy to fall back on old habits and traditions and cherry pick 
what beliefs that are present in culture that we want to incorporate into our belief system. So Paul has a lot of resistance, a lot of opposition, a lot of difficulty to overcome. And today we still have this. We still have, to some extent, the modern day parallel to the false teachers that Paul had would be creeds today. Now there are many churches that have creeds and they provide a solid foundation for the members. The members can look to these creeds and recite them Sunday after Sunday and understand who and whose they are. But when we use those creeds to close out, to cast off, and to keep away all of those who do not embody that, that's a message contrary to the gospel that Paul was sharing. So this ancient letter that was written to the Ephesians still has so much to speak to us today. God is in the midst of all of this, all of us. I, the earth that's suffering right now, the rainforest, or not the rainforest, we don't have rainforests in California on our west coast, but the wildfires that are burning on the west coast, those wildfires, those trees, that wilderness, that was created by God. That's holy stuff. And it's burning literally to the ground. We also have floods following hurricanes in the Gulf and on the East Coast. And all of this stuff is not a part of or different from God but it is all embodied in who God is and who God has created and what God has created. It can't be separated from God any more than we can. So what do we do with this? We can't just say God is up here because God is also in here. God is all around us. And then the message that is so prevalent in society that you deserve God's love and you do not. You are in, you are out. If you believe this, you're good. If you think that, you're bad. And we have a lot of that going on today and it's getting worse and worse. But folks, we are all of God. We all come from that place and we are all holy and divine expressions of God and God's love. And to all those who would de develop doctrines to say, this is what it is to believe in God and to be a godly person. And if you don't follow this exactly, you are not of God. That can be problematic. That which was meant to build and uphold us can also be a tool to tear us down. It's important to know who we are. It's important to know what we need to work on in our lives. It's important to know the practices that will bring us closer to God and those practices that will take us away from God. We want to do more of the stuff that takes us to God, not the stuff that takes us away from God. But we can't thrust that upon others to say, you don't belong. You are not of God. Because again, God can't be separate from what God has made. So this, story, this letter from the Ephesians has volumes to speak to us today. And it all comes back to this economy of God. God isn't in some far off place. God is not separate from us or all that we face. God is as near as the air in our lungs. One of my favorite images about the presence of God is from theologian Marjorie Suhaki. And she says, imagine a creek bed where the water has been flowing through there. And you go and you pick up a rock from the bottom of that creek bed and it's wet. And if you're able to cut that rock in half, you would see water all through the rock, but it doesn't make the rock any less of a rock. It is still rock through and through, 
but it's also wet through and through. Whatever you experience of yourself or God's creation, it is God through and through, and it is also what God created it to be through and through. God is present with all that God has created. So I invite you, as you move forward from today throughout the week, to imagine not only yourselves, but all of the other folks in God's creation, all of us, we are all fallible, but we also have that bit of divine in us as well. And in God's economy, that's the starting point, that there aren't good people and bad people. There's God's people. So how do we use the currency of God's economy of discipline and grace and forgiveness in order to bring us all to God and not away from God. So think about that. Think what gifts you have. Think what the sufferings are in the community around you and find that intersection where you can do God's work. Because the kingdom is not locked. God's community, beloved community, is open to us all. So let's participate together. Build up, not tear down. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have many joys and concerns in our community and in our world. And you see a picture of Helen Stahl with her with those babies that came to see her. And we miss having Helen present with us in worship in Nyanic. And what a picture of joy that is, of many generations coming together there. And that faith that's been handed down through generation to generation, it's a beautiful thing. And that's such a blessing to have. Also, we want to give thanks and praise to God on behalf of Claire Peters. COVID really did a number on Claire. She's at home now and she's recovering. It's going to take some time. And for now, the family is not showing signs of infection or sickness. So we're, we're very grateful for that. So thanks for all of the prayers on her behalf. And you know that there are many joys and many concerns that are within us and around us. And with all of those in our hearts and minds, let us turn to prayer. Gracious God, we offer thanks for this day and for the opportunity to be here together in worship. During this time, may we be able to put aside the, con put aside the concerns of our daily lives let go of all the demands that crowd upon us and simply be present here to your spirit and your words. In the spirit of your psalm, may we be still and know that you are God. O oh God, we offer you prayers of thanksgiving for life and all those things that make life good. As summer concludes and we turn toward fall, we are surrounded by nature's beauty. We offer gratitude for the abundance and the fertility of the earth. The wonders of nature take us unaware and raise our hearts to you. Help us, O oh God, in our gratitude not to take this abundance and beauty for granted. Help us as we work to maintain the health and the beauty of the earth for generations to come as we seek to enter into all the communities of people that are suffering and longing for your healing presence. God, we pray for those who live with violence every day. We pray for those who live with disaster, who don't have clean air or water or food. We pray for those communities who have been hit hard by natural disaster inhuman disaster and we pray for those among our family and friends who need healing in their bodies minds and spirits 
Holy God, help us as well as we seek to make this place a good and divine place for us and for our children, for our neighbors. We know from your words through prophets and apostles that you, O oh God, will get the final word in this life. And that word is life. O oh God, wherever there is distress, you will bring reconciliation. Wherever there is despair, you will bring joy. And wherever there is death, you will bring resurrection. We claim our lives on that and we stand firm on that foundation for our lives. So sustain us, O oh God. Lift our spirits to do your work in this time and place that all people might share in all of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The offertory sentence this morning is from 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. God has given us so much. And as we come around our tables today and return the first fruits of all that God has given us, we come also to receive the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us take a moment and share in communion together. The bread and the cup. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please join me in the benediction, and this benediction comes from Joshua chapter 1. We are strong, we are courageous, for the Lord our God is with us wherever we go. Amen. Bye for now, friends. <laughs>